Um, it'll be on, if you Google, I think, not Google, go on YouTube and type in UCF Study Union. Yeah, I think there. But I know it's live streamed there, so I'm sure that's where it's going to be. So I'm about to start. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. Um, I'm about to start. So is it? All right. Hello, hello. I don't know if they, it's working? All right, I can start. Cool. All right, so this is my UCF study union uh, review. Keep in mind, this shouldn't, should not be your only uh, study tool to prepare for the final. Uh, I didn't like specifically get questions from Kimomi or Hashim. This is just what I came up with from watching your guys' classes uh, in the lecture. So I just put general questions. If you guys have any questions of things that I didn't cover that you'd like to go over, you can ask me towards the end of the session. So whatever you guys would like to go over, we can get to that at the end. Uh, I'm just going to go off this. If you guys feel that you, this isn't exactly what you want, we, like a question that you guys don't think you'll need, we can skip it. So with that being said, I'm going to start right now. Um, all right, so the first question is, what is the correct IEPAC name of the following compound? Uh, I'll give you guys like a minute or so to look at it, and then I'm going to start answering it. All right, do you guys want more time, or should I just start going for it? All right, so first, it's just telling us CH3, so our first carbon. I'll start right here. And then CH2, so then move over one. And I'll just draw like the lines out for like one, two, three. Three hydrogens, CH3. CH2, one, two hydrogens. And then go to another C right here. And then, seeing that I have a C with just an H, that let me know this is probably going to be a double bond. Plus, I looked at all of like, the answer choices, because your test is going to be multiple choice, so you know you're going to have an alkene. So then knowing that, I assume that's probably where my double bond is. Plus, I mean, I'll just get to that after I'm done with this. Once I do that, I drew my double bond. One, two, three. One, two, three. Oh, actually, it's one more carbon out. Whoops. One, two, three. CH three, CH two, C, H over here. Double bonded, and then we have uh, CH two, CH three. So that's an ethyl, and that is coming off of the double bond. One, two. So that's our ethyl, and then we have a CH three in the main chain. So, I mean, I, drew the, I guess I should have drew the double bond here so it's clear to see. But 
I'll just draw it one more time so it's really easy to see. One, two, three, four, five. Alright, so seeing that this is how you draw it, uh, which name do you guys think it would be? I'll say it in like five seconds. I'm sure you guys know which one this is. Uh, this is really important to know the uh, way you name things. You have to go uh, by closest way to get to this functional group, and your functional group is the alkene. So it's kind of easy for this one because you notice that if you go one, two, three, or if you went one, two, three, they both are going to hit your alkene at the third carbon. So you know you're going to have three en, so like three for your alkene. But then you also see that you would like to have your closest substituent in your main chain. So you have to make sure in your main chain that you have, or you have to have the longest carbon chain. So then one, two, three, four, five, six, main chain. But then you realize when you did it this way, your substituent was on your four when it could have been on three if you went the other way. So it'd be better if I went one, two, three, four, five, six. So then this leaves us with 3-EN, uh, also 3 for a methyl. And the amount of carbons we add is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's going to be hex. So you're going to have, I'm just going to look at my answer choices. Hex right there, you satisfied that. 3-EN for 3-alkene, satisfied that. And then 3-methyl. So that leaves us with one o or only one answer choice that works. So is that one. All right, so then number two, select the most acidic compound. Uh, I'll give you guys about one minute to start working on that. I'll give you a hint real quick. Uh, you need to look at the atoms. You have to look at residence structures, uh, conjugate base, stuff like that to figure it out. All right, so for number two, selecting the most acidic compound, just looking at these, I noticed that if you're, looking at, if you're looking at atoms, electronegative atoms, you can already rule out B and you can rule out C because they don't have electronegative atoms. They just have carbons and hydrogens. So then I'm looking at N and I'm looking at H, or I'm looking at the NH groups. But for A versus D, I see that I have an alkene here, but I don't have one here. So knowing that uh, between the fact that this can resonate because you have these lone pairs and you have a double bond, I mean, the fact that it's conjugated is what I meant to say. Because it's conjugated and also it is what's it called? Uh, proton donor, or acids are proton donors, I would uh, pick this one because of the conjugation. Uh, so also technically has a, you look at A, R, I, O, you guys might not know what this means. I don't know if they gave you this acronym in your class. So atoms, uh, resonance, induction, and orbitals. So these two, because they have uh, the atoms of like nitrogen, check off those, so that's leading it to be acidic. Because this one has resonance, that already lets me know that like this would be the one I chose. Uh, induction orbitals are also important in determining acidity, but the hierarchy of like what you choose is atoms, then resonance, then induction, then orbitals. So I don't really have to worry about the other things too much. We already hit a major one to let us know of which one's more acidic. All right, and then number three, yes? more basic. How do you know, excuse me? 
Um, I just know that like electronegative atoms, such as nitrogen, they have like induction, and when you have induction, they will increase acidity. So there's like uh, it's pooling. Sorry, what's it called? Partial positive. I think it's partial positive charge. I just know that electronegative atoms have induction, though, so these ones don't really satisfy that. So I would just know off those two. Um, for number three, it's really simple. It's just asking you E1, SN1, SN2, something like that. Can you move it? Oh, uh, whoops. Sorry about that. Number three is really simple. Ordinarily, I feel like a lot of people would choose um, SN2, but then you'd see a really big problem with that. People would think because you have a Br minus, because it's uh, attached to a sodium, you would have a strong nucleophile, so they think it's SN2. But if you look closely, you have one, two, three groups. So this is tertiary leaving group. So when your bromine would attack here, or what's it called? In an SN2 reaction, you cannot have a tertiary carbocation. So automatically that leaves you with one option, because you know it's substitution with nucleophiles. If it was a base, it'd be a different story, but it's a nucleophile, so. The only option possibly would be SN1, because SN2 will never work in a tertiary position. If you guys need me to show the mechanism for how it happens, I could do that, but you're testing multiple choice, so I don't know if it's that necessary. So just speak up if anyone wants to see mechanisms. All right, so this is identifying the reagents used for the following transformations. Uh, there's many ways you can do pretty much all these problems, I, mean, I guess except for the last one. Uh, these are really simple. You just realize that you have two routes you can go. Uh, one route that many people would like to take, because I guess it's pretty simple, they would just say, let's toss away an OH, because this is a bad leaving group. And you want to make this a good leaving group so you can replace it and eventually get a CN. But one way to do that is to tosylate. That's pretty simple. It's tosylate, or TSCL, PY. That turns that into OTS. Once you have that, you can attack it with any nucleophile you'd like, because it's able to freely leave. And the nucleophile that you would want to choose would be NaCN, and then it'll replace the OH. Um, another way, actually, I would just worry about this one, or worry about it this way for that one. But for the second one, a better way to go about, or I wouldn't say better, but yeah, I guess it's a better way. A quicker, easy, one step way you can go about doing the second problem would be because you have an OH and you want a BR, there's literally one step you can do and then your problem's done with. So you have OH, bad leaving group. You want to replace it and get a BR. You can decide, let's protonate it by adding hydrogen. But there is a way you can do it in one step by having the BR attached to the hydrogen. So hydrogen bromide. And then just using HBR, uh, the lone pair will pick up the hydrogen. Now you have a water. And this will perform an SN1 reaction. It'll become water. It'll leave. And then the bromine will like be negative, And it'll attack. And then you'll have a bromine on this position. So you don't even have to tosylate for that one. And you can just do it in one step. But if you really wanted to, you could just use TSCL, PY as your first step, like we did here. And then you could decide to use NABR and then replace it there. Yes? So the first one, I have used HCN and Orgo2 for some things, but I've never seen you guys use HCN, so that's why I didn't mention it. So I'm sure it probably works, but I would like you guys to confirm that because in Orgo2 is the only time I've ever used HCN. All right, so for the next one, also very simple, and also you should be able to tell of what type of reaction took place just on the fact that you see inversion of configuration. So you just have NASH, the strong nucleophile. When it attacks here, it comes from behind. Um, also, it, uh, you attack with a lone pair. So if you ever draw arrows, not draw arrows, but decide of where the arrow came from on a multiple choice problem, 
make sure the lone pairs are on the sulfur and the arrow is coming directly from the sulfur and attacking from behind of the chlorine and this uh, SN2 attack. SN2 attacks, invert configuration, <laughs> NASH is the nucleophile we use, it's strong. So it's pretty much all there is for that one. I believe so, like just, yeah, NASH. The H does not have lone pairs. Hydrogens usually don't, unless you're left with NAH. If you have NAH right here, um, this is like the only time that you'll pretty much ever see uh, a hydrogen have lone pairs on it, where you attack from the hydrogen. So this is basically like H minus, and this could honestly pick up. I don't want to confuse you. I'll just redraw on the back of this of what NH does, because it's kind of important, but I didn't add it to the study guide. So it might appear, because I did see it in worksheet problems for Kamomi and stuff, uh, and Hashim. So basically, if you have something like an OH group sitting here, and you have sodium hydride, you have lone pairs on your sodium hydride, and you can deprotonate this alcohol. Deprotonating this alcohol leaves you with a negatively charged oxygen. And this can do many different things, but the thing I've seen the most in your class so far was if you have a, let's say some halogen, so like a Br right here, this performs an SN2 reaction because it works as like a strong nucleophile, concerted, attack from here, and then doing that would form uh, a bridge to epoxide, and that's what I've seen the most. It could also do something else, so let's say we were working from here again, but you had <coughs> a methyl iodide. This lone pair could have instead attacked the methyl. And now it picked up a methyl instead of forming a bridge. So there's many different things you can use with sodium hydride. And that's usually the only time you should see lone pairs on an H doing the attack. Um, for this problem, it said provide a systematic name for the compound. So I'll give you guys like a minute and a half to try to figure out what this does, or what the name for that is. Yes. Oh, wait, can you not see it? I'm sorry. One at the top. All right, so I'm gonna get started on this problem. So remember, the first thing you wanna do is find your longest chain. As you can see from here, if you were to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's the longest chain you can get. Going down here would've gave you six. Going from any of these would've given you less. Um, but also, 
important also that I mentioned in the last time we were doing uh, IPAC naming was get to your functional group as quick as possible. And here we have this alkene here, and it's on our second carbon of our longest chain. So we know we'll have two En for our alkene being on our second carbon. And then we'll also have, going down this chain, at number two, well, I'll use a different color. At number two, we have a methyl. At number three, we have a methyl. And at number five, we have a methyl. So if we only had one methyl, it would just be like methyl. If we have two methyls, di. If we have three, tri. So because we have three, it's going to be trimethyl. And you have to make sure to include the number that all of them are resting at. So we have at number two a methyl, at number three a methyl, and at number five a methyl. So that'll be two, three, five. And also, whenever you have a letter next to a number, you do a dash. If it's just two letters next to each other, comma. If it's two numbers next to each other, comma. So two, three, five, and then we have this that'll be next to it, trimethyl. And then we will have the amount of carbons in here will determine like ox, uh, what's it called? Like hexane, heptane, all those type of things. But because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, that's hept, so H-E-P-T. And then right here is where we can put where uh, alkene was sitting at. So because our alkene was at number two, it'll be hept two Ian, and that's how you name that one. Does so anyone have any questions? Cis or trans. Uh, you guys might have to. Do you want to? I can do that one. Yeah. All right, so cis or trans, cis or trans. Wait, do you guys do E and Z also? Yeah, so I don't even worry about that. I can give you, I mean, I could probably find another problem. I'd make up a problem for ENZ after. But also, I'm going to mention for, before I get to that question, if we had one, two, three, four, I guess I should have drew it straight. Just pretend this is straight. One, two, because when you have an alkyne, the carbon chain is straight. Um, if I have an alkene sitting at my second carbon going from this side, but it's also have an alkyne sitting at my second carbon going from the other side, uh, your alkene will take priority in naming. So like in numbering, you're going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You're not going to go the other way around because alkene and double bonds take priority in naming over triple bonds. Yeah, that's what I was saying. Make sure to draw it linear. I just realized after I drew it to uh, add the triple bond there. Um, what else was I going to say? Cis or trans, cis or trans. I don't. this problem, normally I just look at the groups sitting on the double bond, but like they're both just R groups going this way. So I wouldn't even name this as a trans. I believe that's why they didn't mention it in the answer sheet. Or, oh, there's an answer sheet for this one. Huh. Yeah, I mean, there's R groups going on both sides, so I wouldn't worry about cis trans for that one, I'm pretty sure. Um, for the expected major product for the reaction shown, uh, this is really simple. This is just addition, and it's telling you one equivalent of HCl. So that means on a triple bond, and we have the bigger group on this side, HCl wants to be Markovnikov, so that means you're adding your chlorine to the bigger group. So that means it'll be sitting over 
on this side for when we add our for first chlorine for the one equivalent. And you're going to get rid of one double bond when you do that. But now we have one equivalent of HBr. So it also wants to be my Pavnikov. So it's getting added over here also. So now it's alkane. That's gone. So your final product would look like C L B R N It looks something like that. Uh, and then it doesn't really matter what the, like if you drew it anti or sin because they're, it's kind of irrelevant here. You were comparing it to hydrogens, you can't really show that. Or you could, but it's line bond, you don't really draw hydrogens. Yes? Intermediate, carbocation with chlorine attached to it. You're saying when I have, I should draw it. HCl. So, carbocation with chlorine atta attached to it. You're saying if you attack here, oops, and it does that. So then, once you attack here, this H would form here. And then you'd have a Cl minus, and then you have like all your lone pairs. And then, oh wait, I didn't draw the carbon head in here. Is this what you're asking for? The double bond leaves, it picks up a hydrogen on the we substituted side, and then you have a carbocation on the other side where the hydrogen wasn't picked up. So the hydrogen got picked up over here, and your carbocation was formed on the side where the hydrogen did not get picked up on. Uh, yes. HCl and HBr are always more Kovnikov unless you are given peroxide. And then the same thing happens. I can draw that if you guys would want for the HBr, unless you guys think you, OK. Yes. Even like HF or something, or HI? I don't recall using HF fluorine, but I recall using HI. And I'm pretty sure you can use like I and uh, HI and adding an I over something. So, But I, wouldn't, I would check on the HF. H uh, HF for what? Oh, okay. Oh, there's problems. All right. So this is just a word problem. It's saying what effect does the conjuga conjugation of a carbonyl group with a carbon-carbon double bond have? So a carbonyl is just the double bonded CO, that's right here. And it's saying, what effect is conjugation of a carbonyl group have? Uh, conjugation is just on an adjacent carbon when you have a double bond. So it's saying, what effect would it have on the IR absorption due to the C double bond O stretch? If you form a double bond adjacent to this carbonyl, excuse me? push it down field to a higher frequency. It would shift to a lower frequency. That's just what conjugation does. So if you were sitting at originally like a ketone at 1700, I believe it is, and then you, that's 1650. Give me one second. Uh, carbonyl or ketone? See, and that is what I can hear you. All kinds are. Uh, seed, like a ketone, is around 1700. And 
whether it's conjugated or not will raise it by 50 or like it'll stay where it is. So that's what that's saying. And the answer to this is just like knowing that it does this. Like the reason why NMR and spec is kind of hard to teach to people is it's just memorizing what each thing does. So just. You're asking if, I'm saying that, what's it called? It's saying, what did the conjugation do? What did adding a double bond next to the ketone do? So, yes, it shifts it to a lower frequency, which made the wavelength lower. Or it shifts it to lower frequency, which made the wavelength longer, I meant to say. Um, I believe it's 1650, or it starts at 1650, goes 1700. I Yeah, it just, conjugation would decrease, I believe. Uh, before we get over, are done with this, I'll check the NMR spec, like I have a graph to make sure I got any of these facts correct, or wrong. But for this one, this is really simple. Just make sure you memorize this. I have s don't see any reason why this won't be on your test to find out the degrees of unsaturation, which HDI stands for hydrogen deficiency. Uh, so you guys need to memorize this, and then I'll explain what HDI does. But basically, it's just see there. Wave number, wave number, and wavelength on the IR spec higher the wave number. Wave number and wavelength are different, I believe. Yeah, if you move to the left, your wave number, yeah, increases, yes. I have it right. It is hindering it because, as like a general standard, a lot of the time your ketone, just a basic ketone, will be about 1710. But if you have it conjugated, if you have this C double bond C, uh, it'll go to around 1690. So it made the. the CC bond has a lower. The CC bond is 1600. C double bond C. This part right here is 1600. Uh, this on its own, C double bond O, that is 1710. But if you have this next to this, this will be about, uh, whoops, I drew it wrong. It'll be 1690 around there. So the conjugation decreased its original value. That make sense? Alright, so this one is just plugging in. So I just start off with we have half, and then you do two times the carbons. So we have five carbons, five, and then we do plus two, minus nitrogens. We have one nitrogen, so minus one. Excuse me? Plus nitrogen? Oh, oops, my bad. Thanks for catching that. Plus nitrogen, so plus one. Minus the hydrogens, so minus nine. And then minus any halogens. We don't have any halogens, so. That's all we have there. So one, or half of this, so two times five, that's 10. Plus two, 12. Plus one, 11. 11 minus nine, two. 14. Add, add, add. Two C plus two. Two C plus two plus one minus nine. Oh, okay. All right, so you're saying the final number you calculated this is thirteen? Because you said two times five plus two minus
All right, so after you divide it by 2 or after? So then all of this equals 2. So that means we have 2 degrees of unsaturation. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys know what that means, but if you have only one, or if you have 0 degrees of unsaturation, that means you're not going to have any double bonds and you'll not have a ring. If you have 1 degree of unsaturation, you can have either a double bond or a ring. Uh, if you have 2 degrees, you can have one of each, or, yeah, or both. Uh, and then you can have for three degrees. You can have three rings, you can have two double bonds, you can have just any mixture of them as long as you have equal out to three. And then for four, you will always have benzene. So. It doesn't discriminate. So I tested it earlier. You're like, you can even have three rings with like a weird, like, uh, if it's three for your HDI value, you could still just have three rings instead of having three double bonds. So I've seen a lot more of double bonds, but I wouldn't discriminate just Check what you have. Um, that's pretty much just how to do that one, but I'm not going to really focus on this one because it works the same way. Just make sure to include your halogens into the formula. And then keep in mind that O is not one of these values, so you pretty much just ignore the oxygen. This is also just knowing the names of the hydrogens and stuff like this. So I just put it here, that way you guys don't forget them. And we can go over that once I'm done going through the rest of this. Uh, for number 10, it's asking for this. The vibration of which bond gives an IR absorption that distinguishes between the following two compounds. So looking at here, you remember that IR really cares about functional groups, but, oh, sorry you notice that IR really cares about functional groups. So uh, one of the really obvious peaks that I would have noticed without even like, thinking about this is OH is extremely obvious. It'll give you a very, very broad peak around the 3,000 range. So if you ever see like a really broad peak and it's not like spiky or anything like that in the 3,000 range, you're going to have an alcohol. So just knowing that, it was like this is going to be the most obvious choice to make when you're looking at your graph. Like, this has an ether, but I wouldn't worry about that. This is way easier to see in a graph. Okay, so this one, it says which functional group would be found in this IR spectrum. And yeah, so very good. This is pretty easy to see. Just 1,700 range, strong, uh, really narrow peak. You're going to notice that's a ketone, 1,700. If it was like around here, that would mean it's conjugated. But if, because it's just sitting at uh, 1710, you just know you uh, have a ketone. It's not conjugated or anything. So it's just memorizing these graphs. Uh, the double bond next to the carbonyl. No, like right here. So if you have this double bond sitting next to this ketone, then it'll shift over to the right. Yes. Um, which structure best fits the data below? So this is really simple. Uh, this right here is the molecular ion, so it's telling us the mz value would equal 80. But then you look for your highest peak, which is your base peak, to see what's going to fragment off. So looking at all of these three, you see all of these three, and you check the weight of all of these. I already welcome. 
I already checked the weight of all three, or all four of these, and I know that chlorine is around 35. It's like 34.5, I think. It's 35.5? It's just 35? Yeah. So then if you have that and you subtract it from 80, you're left with 43 as the fragment, which is what the base peak was. So basically, this chlorine, once it leaves, uh, what am I trying to say? 35. Yeah. Uh, so this chlorine, once it leaves, will leave you with your m plus one. M plus one? Yeah, m plus one. M plus one equaling 43. And that's just how you get this answer. These all give you completely different values. Oh yeah, that's another good point. M plus two? Yeah, it's probably M plus two, my bad. Yeah, that's a good point. If you look here, this is one, whoops one-third the height of this, so two-thirds, uh, three-thirds. So you notice that this is one-third the height of here, so that already pretty much tells you you're working with chlorine versus like bromine or any of these other things, so that's another good way to figure out what it is without actually, yes. M plus two. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. She said, I forgot about that. M plus two is how chlorine works. Bromine is different. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. Very good. All right, so for this next problem, the I'll take out the other paper so you can see what the rest of the answer is. So these are the rest of the answer choices. And you're trying to select the absorption band you would expect to see below. And for this one, it's really simple. You see a carboxylic group right here. And you see this alkyne. So you just need to know the ranges or like values for each of these. I guess one of them's a range. So knowing that, you would have 3,300 for one of them, and 2,500 to 3,300 for the other value. And for the 3,300 range, or 3,300, not 3,300 range. 3,300 would be your, it, carboxylic, carboxylic, C-O-O-O-H. No. Um, 2,500 to 3,300 is carboxylic. Well, I'll just straight up 3,300 is your sp3 hybridized carbon, or sp, I mean, hybridized carbon. So that's just how you find that, just memorizing all the different values for all of them. Uh, I believe they gave them to you in class. I know Kamomi gave them to his uh, le lecture. So that's how you do that one. For this one, it's which of the following does not represent a smaller charged fragment of the original molecule? Excuse me. Yep. Look at the actual 
All right, so I guess I should have drawn it a way that you could have seen it clear. This is SP, it's actually right here, SP hybridized CH bond. This is what you're actually looking at for your SP CH, like the value. That's the value that corresponds to this part. Just the alkyne itself, I get what you're saying. That works differently, but just SP hybridized carbon attached to an H. This H will give off on the graph. Yes. OK, so which of the following does not represent a smaller charged fragment of the original molecule? So base peak is going to represent not the entirety of the molecule. Base peak right here, whoops, right here is still a positively charged fragment. So clearly that can't be, whoops, what if I hit that? 14A. Clearly that can't be an answer choice. Uh, molecular ion, I mean, I already know this is the answer because it's literally just the total amount, like it's the entire thing, it's not a fragment. So that's just the answer. And then the radical cation is just radicals positively charged, cation, cations positively charged, it's not an anion. So this is technically a fragment. What's a radical cation? All right, so a radical cation would be like radicals or something you guys only did at the very like end of your semester, but like if you have Br2 and you have the Br attached to the Br, it's the one like electron, uh, excuse me? Homolytic, yes, because they're the same thing. Also, I need to make sure, I feel like the arrow, there's like a bunch of arrows, I'm, I need to double check on where the arrows come from. But basically, the cation is just, or the radical cation is just the single arrow, fish hook, one electron going over to whatever you're attacking is what a radical cation is. True or false, all of the following represent positively charged species. Oh, is that the same problem? Oh, yeah, it is different. All right, so all right, so we already discussed that radical cation, this is a cation, positively charged, base peak, this is still positively charged, we discussed that earlier, molecular ion, it's just the whole thing, it's still positively charged. And then parent ion, it's also just positively charged. So, I mean, the answer is just true for this. Uh, it just, excuse me? Parent ion is just, uh, parent ion, parent ion. It's the same as the molecular ion. They're the exact same, it's just a different word for it. All right, so. The mass spectrum fragment that is observed from MZ43 of the following compound is, all right, this is the following compound. Oops. So basically, you need your MZ to equal 43. Propyl group. Yeah, so pretty much a propyl is equal to 43 because 12 from this carbon right here, 12 from this carbon, 12 from this carbon. Oh, whoops, I did not mean to draw that there, whoops. And then you have three from the hydrogen, two from this hydrogen, three from this. You add all of these up together, and that'll equal up to 43. Wait, 12, 12, 1, 2, 3, 36 plus 6, yeah, it's 43. All right, so basically, we're just trying to figure out which one of these is the purple, and it's pretty easy to see that CH3, CH2, CH3 will not equal out to the purple that we're looking for. CH2, CH2, CH3 would be the purple that, wait, let me just make sure. Yep, CH2, CH2, CH3 is the purple for the 
fragment we're looking for because this will equal out to 43. And that's all you do for this one. For number 17, HDI of 0. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I meant to do. D, D, D. It's when you have, if you draw out, yeah, I should have drawn out the whole thing to make it make more sense. All right, so if you have the whole thing drawn out, CH3, CH2, 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 CH3. When you break off this purple right here, it is CH2 right here, CH2, and then CH3. Breaking off this fragment right here will be this. Uh, but, I mean, yeah, once it's broken off, then it will have three hydrogens. So I'm pretty sure that's what it's supposed to be. Let me just make sure. CH2, CH3. I mean, I'm just going to add it up in the calculator to make sure the math's right. It's right? Two, two, three? All right, yeah, so that's the fragment that would be. All right, so an HDI of zero indicates, these are just the things I said earlier. If you guys wrote them down, you guys know what the answer to this is. So just using that HDI formula earlier, which was right here, plugging in all these things from your formula will tell you if you have zero, one, two, three, four, stuff like that. If you only have zero, it's going to have no unsaturation. There won't be any multiple bonds. There won't be ring closings. It'll just be all sp3 hybridized or sp3 hybridized carbons. So completely alkane. Um, if it's HDI equals one, it could be something like this, where it's alkene, but it could also be a ring. And then. If it's HDI of 3, it could be something like a triene. So 1, 2, 3, something like that. And then anything with an HDI of 4, It won't be exclusively a benzene, so uh, my bad for saying that earlier, but it's just most likely, the majority of the time, it's a pretty safe bet that you're going to have a benzene. So HDF0 will be no unsaturation. All right, so this is just select the correct units of wave numbers in IR spectroscopy. They're not in joules. They're not in nanometers. They are in centimeters. Uh, I don't know what the word for that was. Centimeters to the power of one, I guess. And they're not in, I don't know if that even is, is a prep. Just seconds. But I don't know what the one means. Power of one, I guess, just. Like how to say it. For 18? Yeah. No, the answer for 18 is going to be C, wave numbers. It's in units of centimeters to the power of 1. All right, so this one, it's just saying which peak also, uh, likely represents the molecular ion. The molecular ion will be the like total mz value for it. So it's just going to be the highest number most of the time. So knowing that, your mz should equal to 100. Well, like, 
the highest peak right here is a base peak, so it's not going to be that. M plus and excuse me? M plus, uh, MZ is molecular ion. M plus one, you mean? Oh. Yeah, I believe they're the exact same. But M plus one would be a different value. Yeah. If the question was asking me for M plus two, you're saying? If the if it went if there was another one where it just said one or two here, but it still said the same question. No. The answer would be one or two. It's the furthest one along. Well not if one hundred is taller, right? Not if it's easy? Like say if one hundred is taller than the one at one or two, then Oh yeah. If you have a higher peak at one hundred and you have a lower peak at one oh two. Yes, the one or two is your isotope. Uh, which of the following chemical shifts best indicates the presence of a carboxylic acid? This is just another thing to memorize. So, yep, she got it right. The answer is just D. If you see a PPM at 12, you always, yeah, carboxylic acid is the only thing that can give you a PPM at 12. Other values of this? Oh, you mean the PPMs? You mean this, 20? All right, so give me like five seconds that it saved here. All right, so 12, we said is COOH halogens, so an X would be from 2 to 4. If you have an aldehyde, so this, it would be like, I mean, 9 is pretty common. Like around 8.5, whoops, 8.5 to around 10. And I would double check on this last one because I'm not 100% positive, but 7 for benzene. 6.5 to 8 for that one. All right, so she says 6.5 to 8, so I mean 7 technically would be. So, but yeah, it's better to know the range because then you can know clear. Oh, 6.5 to just 8, so 8.0. Benzene. Are there any other common ones that you think would be important? I don't know if there are any other ones <laughs> that are common. Uh, 21. For each pair of compounds, identify the more acidic compound. Uh, I'll let you guys look at that for a second, and then I'll continue. Try it in the textbook. All right, thank you for that. 
I guess I'll just write out the other values really quick so you guys can know them. All right, so benzene, we had 6.5 to 8. 9 to 10 was aldehyde. So 9 is more specific for this one. 12 is, the only reason I said uh, 12 for carboxylic acid is it's the only thing that could be 12, but this goes from 10 to 12. And then an SP hybridized CH bond will give you 1.5 to 2.5. I don't recall doing that before. What was the point of adding them? What do you mean? Add, excuse me. CNMR. Yeah, I. I don't recall doing that when I took the class. Yeah, like the one we did mention, so I doubt you have to do it, so yeah. And then an SP3 carbon to an H was 0 0.9 to 2. And then you have, I'll just draw one more. C, C, H. So this is Z, but this Z can be N, O, or X. And this equals to 2.54. Right, thank you for that. So these are just common PPM values. And for this one, it's just identifying the more acidic compound. So I'm not going to cover all of these because I feel like synthesis might be pretty important and that takes a while, so I put a bunch of those on here. So you guys might want to know those. So then for the first one, out of these two, it's going to be this alkyne. So for these, you check what the conjugate base is. So I mean, redrawing this. This would have a negative charge. Or whoops, one second. One, two, three. Second, three. And basically, this question I picked is really important because orbitals, having this sp3 orbital trumps uh, negatively charged nitrogen. Like, the normally the order goes A, R, I, O. And normally you'd see, like, I have this A for this nitrogen, so naturally I would think that this would be more acidic. But this is one of the rare exceptions where, or er, not, not oxygen, orbitals right here, because this is an alkyne, and it would form a negatively charged alkyne when you deprotonated that this sp3 
negatively charged or sp negatively charged orbital would be more acidic than this negatively charged nitrogen or NH. Um, this next one, you just look at, where is it? You look at these two and the induction of having an extra oxygen here. Not induction was the word. Oh, because those there are two oxygens, like normally like I have this O right here and this O right here. You compare those. Um, they're the same. And what you're trying to do is deprotonate. But if you deprotonate these two things, you're left with a negatively charged O here. All over here you're left with this negatively charged O. This one will take priority due to the fact that you can resonate this one up and form the double bond back over here. And resonance is a really big contributor into the fact of how uh, acidic it is. So it'll just form into basically the exact same thing that it started out as. But because it can keep resonating back and forth, this makes it really acidic. While this one cannot resonate the same way. So that one beats it in acidity. So this one's more acidic. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yep. Adam, Adam, Adam. Oh, so A stands for atom, but it's, I believe it's because they're all the same atom, but it's like, what's the word? If one doesn't have any atoms, like any oxygens or nitrogens or anything like that, I believe that will take uh, effect in determining acidity. So if one's just all carbons and hydrogens, uh, that'll matter versus comparing it to something with oxygens and all these other random things. But if, uh, what's it called? If you're just comparing oxygens to oxygens, uh, I don't think that really matters in determining acidity because you're just comparing like once you deprotonate something, how acidic is it off of, can it resonate? Really big thing. Uh, the orbitals, stuff like that. Um, the first one is more acidic because of the rare exception where an sp hybridized carbon, like this negatively charged, where is it, did I draw it? This negatively charged uh, alkyne. Oh, what are these two? Is that because it has resonance? Oh, yeah, that's why. Because you can't resonate between these two right here. And, I mean, this won't resonate into here either, so this, it's not resonating. Um, I'm going to move on to... Where is it? Which ones? Which one? So for ketone, alkene, I'll be honest, when I was making this test, this was not actually what the actual, this structure was not on the thing, so I never even checked this one, because that's not even what it looked like. It wasn't on um, the book when I was getting questions. So then comparing these two, NH2OH, NH2OH.
for this one. Deprotonate, deprotonate, deprotonate. This would be negatively charged here. This would be negatively charged over here. One, two, three, carbon. Because there's no hydrogen over here. Or, I mean, I drew that to show that there's nothing there. And also there's none over here. So you can only have like pretty far away for your, when you deprotonate it. Um, this one actually takes into effect of, what's it called? The negative charge actually takes into effect on the carbonyl and the oxygen. Like it takes more, it has a stronger pull. This partial positive charge here will be affecting this uh, negative charge because it's really close to it. This one won't, so pretty sure this is going to be the more acidic. While for NH2, comparing it to this carboxylic acid, just knowing that, I mean, this is an acid. So generally, oops. Generally, this is more acidic. If I deprotonate this, this will be O minus. This will be N, H, two lone pairs, two lone pairs. It resonates up. This can resonate in. This can resonate in. Um, is oxygen bigger than nitrogen? Is it is? All right, so oxygen's bigger? Nitrogen's 14. Oh. Oxygen is bigger. All right. Wait, is oxygen more electronegative? I think that's what it was. All right, so oxygen's more electronegative. So I'm pretty sure because it's more electronegative, the atom itself is more electronegative, that this should be the answer. Also, I mean, you just know that it's carboxylic acid is very acidic. Oh, this one. It literally goes like, this is your highest priority, then second priority, third priority, fourth priority. Uh, for the rare exception of for number, uh, or for letter A, this uh, alkyne can trump the negatively charged nitrogen. But for B, if you're going to like just the atoms, then second I can read the exact description for why that one works. for this one? Oh, but we're not just going by just the atoms. Uh, we're going by resonance. Like this one can't resonate at all, and this one's resonance stabilized. So this takes into effect. These both have oxygen atoms, so you're not really worrying about that. If one of them just with carbons, yes? No, just the atom. Just the fact that there are those atoms. Excuse me? 21, which part? This one? Uh, I believe it would be, but in this case, this wasn't even a natural problem that I pulled, so I never even looked at it earlier. I accidentally formatted it incorrectly. Are these the same? What were these questions asking? Uh, 22. Oh, this is determining the relationship between each one. So, looking at this, oh, whoops. Looking at this, I see that my bromine is on my second carbon, and this bromine is on my third carbon. <coughs> Yes, so because you have the same amount of carbons, hydrogens, halogens, everything, it's going to be constitutional isomer, but it's not the same compound because one has your bromine on your second carbon while the other one has it on my third carbon. If they're both on the second carbon, they'd be the same compound. That's pretty much how that one works. For uh, B right here, oh, I'll circle it. Or no, I'll write it down. Const 
constitutional isomer for this one. These are also just constitutional isomers because if you count the carbons and hydrogens, they're the exact same. They're just rearranged differently. This one decided to have a double bond for its insaturation, or like hydrogen deficiency, which is what HDI stands for. Well, this one decided to have a ring, but the formula is the exact same. Same carbon, same hydrogens. So this is also constitutional isomer. This one right here, if you go one, two, three, one, two, three, they both hit the methyl at the same point, and they have the exact same formula. So if you were to name it, which I could do if you guys need me to, uh, you would notice that they are the exact same compound. So basically, if whenever you name things and you realize the name is the exact same, then it should be the same compound. For these ones, uh, this is supposed to be like dashed. It's kind of hard to see. These ones are enantiomers of each other because they're just mirror images of each other. That's just what enantiomers mean. Well, like also another way to determine if you want to figure out and uh, if it's an enantiomer or a diastereomer, diastereomer or something like that, you would label the chirality centers. So if this was R, R, I'll draw it bigger, R, R. To be an enantiomer, this would have to be S, S. So all of the chirality centers, the configuration uh, would have to change. Also with the fact that it can mirror is another important part. Well, for this one, if this was also, keep in mind, I didn't actually check what these would be. These are all like carbons anyway, so it's kind of weird. Keep in mind uh, that these, if this was RS and this was RR and only one of your chirality centers changed, that'd be a diastereomer. Comparing these two, if you were to name it, reaching your functional group first, this would give you one, two. You'd have to go start from this side, so this would also be one, two. So you'd realize they both hit the functional group at the same carbon. So it's the same compound, because everything else remained the same. Same carbon, same hydrogens, same functional group, same everything. For the next one, it's working the same way. You go from either side, you realize you hit an OH on your third carbon, and you realize if you were to name it, it's exactly the same compound still. Which that one's really easy to see because they didn't draw it in differently, so I don't really know why that one's the question. But. Um, even if one was a wedge or a dash, they would still be the same, like R or S. So is it only an enantiomer if there are more than two? Yes. Yes. You need at least two for diastereomer and enantiomer. You need all of your chiral centers to change. And then for these ones, these are supposed to be dashes. It's kind of hard to see. If you were to go one, two, in either way, you'd realize the name would be the exact same. So let's say this one is R, this one would be S. This one probably be S, this would be R. You could still go one, two, three. I'm not saying this that is what it is, but most likely, I'm pretty sure that one's S, one's R, one's S, one's R for both these. You could still go one, two, three, one, two, three, and still have one, uh, your second carbon would have like an R for your chlorine, 
either way around. And then an S for the other chlorine. So it'd still be named the exact same way. For this dimethyl compound, it's the same thing, just figure out what the name is and you should be good. Yep, all of these are the exact same compounds. Invert what? Uh, just to draw it out, I will do this. CO. If we have this and our highest priority is 1, second highest priority is 2 over here, 3 over here, and then we'd have this hydrogen at number 4. We would go this way, which would be R because it's clockwise. And then draw this out. Highest priority one. Second two again. Then three. So it's going this way. So when they are both dashed, you have this RS. And then when they're both wedged, it'd be like SR. But you could still name it going from either way because you're just trying to hit the uh, substituent as soon as possible. So going from one, two, three, like eventually one, two. Eventually at your second carbon, you could still get an R this way, or you can go one, two, and still hit like an R both ways around. So you'd still have like R chlorine or R for your methyl, just stuff like that. I Oh, did not see that one. Whoops, my bad. All right, so I'm naming it going one, two. This one's going one, two. Three, four, five, three, four, five. These will be, they'll have the exact same uh, carbons and hydrogens. They will have a different, what's it called? Yeah, one cis and one's trans. So going from cis and trans, uh, one being cis and one's trans, uh, but it has all the exact same everything else, this would give me a diastereomer. Stereoisomer, stereoisomer. Let me just make sure, just because I feel like this was diastereomer, but it's good to be certain. That's what I was thinking too, because all I need is two chiral centers. Constitutional, one second. I'm just going to name it because that's the easiest way to make sure. No chiral centers. Yeah, because you only have one hydrogen here, and then this double bond, one carbon, carbon. Carbon, C, H. Yeah, you can't even have a chiral center there, and then these are two hydrogens, yeah. I'm going to double check before we leave here, but yeah, I would definitely say constitutional isomers at first glance, because they have the same of everything, and no chiral centers, so you kind of need chiral centers to be diastereomers. Yeah, but the bonds from the same percentage points, I'm going to be a stereoisomer, because they're making a difference. Like, one's on these. Yeah, like one cis, one trans. Right. So, wait, stereoisomer what? You're saying constitutional isomer? No, it's stereo. Stereo is when they just define their, um, right, and then they're Um, I'm going to try it stereoisomer so I can get back to that after or before we finish. But 
because I wanted to get through synthesis, I'm going to try to speed through these parts real quick. Uh, these are just definitions, so knowing if a racemic mixture of enantiomer is, is optically inactive. Uh, racemic mixtures are what you get when you have chiral centers and you do an S one reaction. They will give you, let's say you ended up with a Cl on one, you'll get also the enantiomer in an S one reaction. That stands for enantiomer. Uh, these are technically optically inactive. Er, yes, I, I'm pretty sure it was inactive. Did I say the word active or? A meso compound will have exactly one non-superimposable mirror image. Uh, not, er, one non-superimposable, this is the keyword, mirror image. That means enantiomer, meso compounds have like a plane of symmetry. They are optically inactive, achiral, so they can't have a non-superimposable mirror image because there's no, like if it has a plane of symmetry, you could always place it over itself, which is how meso compounds work. All right, so this is just predicting the final products. So if you know how to do this, you zoom in. Uh, let me see how this works. Is that good? OK, you're welcome. All right, so excess NaNH2. Uh, I'm going to let you guys look at these real quick, and while you do that, I'm going to check on one thing real quick. All right, so I'm going to start putting the answers down, but I don't know if this can actually pick this up. All right, so this should answer the question you are asking earlier. Um, if you see that, well, this is cis over here, and this is trans. If the only difference is it goes from cis to trans, it's technically a diastereomer. So does that answer the question you're asking? About the, so the original answer of the, this part was diastereomer.
Okay, so X is any NH2. What that'll do if we have two halogens on the same carbon, it will get rid of both of these halogens and form an alkyne. So technically, I'll just redraw this so it looks more accurate. And then if we had H2O as our second reagent, it would technically put an H, a, a hydrogen right here. But because we didn't, and we have E2Cl, this will give us terminal alkylation, which means this positively charged ethyl will get attacked by this lone pair that was formed over here. And the ethyl will form terminally. And then our third step will give us, using H2 and luminous catalyst gives you an alkene, and it'll always be a cis alkene. Sorry if it's kind of hard to tell that this is supposed to be cis. All right, so this next one, using NaNH2MEI, this deprotonates one hydrogen. So we're getting rid of one of these hydrogens. And it will add this methyl group. So we have this. And I'll just leave this hydrogen over here. And now we have this CH3 attached, which is a methyl. Now we have 9BBN H2O2 NaOH. And this is called the hydroboration oxidation. What this will give us is an aldehyde whenever we have one terminal alkyne. So I'm going to draw it. Actually, I'll keep it the way it is. This. There, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So the H will be here. Why do I draw this upside down? Whoops. Normally I draw everything on this side, so that's why it looks kind of funny. this aldehyde. Wait one second. One, two. With this methyl still attached from when we did this terminal alkylation. Uh, I'm going to start doing the next one on the this is where Oh, I just realized how poorly it's set up. This would be C. So what happened again is we got rid of it, a hydrogen using Na NH2 ETI. We have this triple bond. It's going to add this ET from the ethyl iodide. One, two. There's still this hydrogen here, by the way. And then we have HDSO4, H2SO4, and then water. That'll give us a ketone. Uh, 
looks kind of weird. For the next one, for D, we have NaNH2. So these are all just like deprotonating and alkylating terminally. So that's gone. Add some methyl. So we had this triple bond, methyl. Deprotonated this other hydrogen. That's gone. Added a methyl again. Oh, wait, no, that's an ethyl. Whoops. Added this ethyl. And then we have sodium and liquid ammonia. And what sodium and liquid ammonia does is when you have an alkyne, it turns it into a trans alkene. So you have this, this. This will be where a double bond is. And because it's trans, it'll be facing the opposite direction. So this will be the final product formed from that. See what? Answer B. Uh, where is B? A, B. So it added a methyl and then turned it into an aldehyde. So where did my aldehyde at? Oh, here. This is answer B. So like this is from the NaNH2 MEI step, and then this was our alkyne. So using that reagent turns an alkyne into an aldehyde, and that's all that happens there. So this is proposing a plausible synthesis for each of the following transformations. Where does it say that? So then for because we only have 23 minutes left, I will, I don't know, are there specific ones you'd want to go over out of these ones? or Because I want to get through some of the other ones on, oops, not this page, but. Uh, yeah, I post the answers afterwards. So, but are there any you guys want to go over now so you can just see what happens? Or, I mean, you guys, you guys see online anyway, too, so. Uh, I'll just do these ones then for now. So for this one, because we have, you see BRs adding on opposite sides, but they have the, what's it called? They have anti addition, and they are like two bromines, but they're anti addition. That means one way you can get that would be using a BR2. But you notice that the main carbon chain is set up in like this transposition. So also BR2, if I were to just add BR2 to an alkyne, I would have got a BR here, and it would be opposite of the other BR. But the problem with that is, is I'd still have this double bond here. So I need to get rid of the double bond some way. So I would just do the one that turns it into trans. So I would just do N or sodium and liquid ammonia. So first step would be Na and then NH3L. Once I do that as my first step, my second step would be Br2 because it gives them the opposite stereochemistry on adjacent carbons. So that would give me this. But then the way where you can get them to be the same stereochemistry works differently. So this one, I don't even need to turn them into an alkene. I can just do HBr for my first step. So using HBr would give me uh, 
uh, it doesn't really determine whether it's like cis or trans. So, but trans is what's it called? More favored because it's less sterically hindered. It's more stable. So that's why I drew the trans configuration, and it will add a BR to uh, technically either side, but I would just because they're both substituted the same way. And technically, it's in plane right now. But if I add one more HBR, ordinarily, it adds to the most substituted side. But because there's no way to differen uh, differentiate, you could use for your second step HBR in peroxide, and it'll go for the antimer carbon to carbon addition. In this situation, I'm just using that to tell, uh, like, to tell it that it's going to go to the other side. They're both uh, the same, so it doesn't really differentiate whether they're carbon to carbon or antimer carbon to carbon. But I'm just doing this to show uh, this is one way you can determine if you get the most to be, like, if your first HBR gave you. Uh, a wedge, your second HBR can give you a wedge by adding again both peroxide but on the other side. If you didn't add both peroxide, you just have two BRs sitting here and they would be clearly the opposite stereochemistry. But if I use, what's it called, HBR Oh, and another way to explain why this BR2 in here worked differently would be if you have a double bond and you have BR2, oops, sorry. And you have BR2, one's technically more positive than negative, so you just pick one to get attacked no really way to differentiate. You just know that if they're joined together, you have to have opposite charges. That way, that's how they're joined together. So you use this to attack it. And when it attacks it, it'll form with the same stereochemistry on both sides, but it'll be a bridge. And there'll be a BR between the bridge. And after you do this, this was used up. You're left with a BR minus negatively charged nucleophile it's going to want to attack from the back side, and it's going to break the bridge. And now you're going to have opposite configuration on each uh, adjacent carbons. So that's how BR2 works, giving you the opposite stereochemistry. For a, the problem with that is, is it only uses. Did you notice how in the first step right here, it used one double bond to form the bridge? So you need to make it alkene for the mechanism to work correctly. One equivalent of Br2. Uh, what I'm trying to say is. Using BR2 only gets rid of one double bond. You'd still have an alkene. It, that's if we had the alkyne. Using BR2 would get rid of just one of these double bonds. Oh, OK. No, that's fine. The rest of these problems pretty much work the same, so I'm just going to move on to something different. It's like just identifying what the products of these would be. So. These are pretty simple. We have ETOH. It's a weak nucleophile, weak base. So we're going to get, um, I guess this product. So I mean, we're technically going to get uh, in the tertiary position, you have this piece, this piece, this piece. Weak nucleophile, weak base. SN1 and E1, 
Uh, it's kind of hard to determine which one would be the major for the situation, but given heat, which there is no heat here, if you got heat, most likely your major product will be elimination, but if you do not have heat, the majority of the time your major product will be based on uh, substitution. So here we have ETOH. This ethanol attacking here for this next problem, OTS is just a really good leaving group. And VR is a strong nucleophile, so it's just going to attack here. It's in the primary position, so that means we can only have one thing. And the primary position with the nucleophile, substitution, primary, means we need to do SN2. So this is just going to be, there's no stereochemistry chemistry here, so you could just write like BR. So that's really easy. How much time do we have? 14 minutes. I'm going to move on to this, and then we can go back to things before I finish. This is just saying which of the following carbocations are the most stable. So looking at these positions, you see this is going to be secondary. This one is considered, you have this double bond here, adjacent one carbon away, you have a carbocation, so that's called allylic. And then this is just sitting at the primary position. And then this one is tertiary because you have these three R groups. So knowing that, the most stable things that you guys have to worry about most of the time is just tertiary, and then it goes secondary, and then primary. But if you ever see this, this is extremely stable because it's resin and stabilized. So allylic takes priority over this. So that would mean this is your most stable this is your second most stable, this is your third most stable, and this is your fourth most stable. For this, this is really simple. You have OTS, a good leaving group. It's primary, so that means you need to get rid of this with an SN2 reaction. But right here, if we just used OTS, water, water text here. It would just form, at first it would just form, what's it, one, two, three, four. At four, uh, first it would form water sitting here, but because water is abundant, you could just use H2O again to deprotonate this, and then it would form into an OH, so then you'd get the product you wanted. This is primary, so it wants to be SN2, so you wouldn't be able to do all of that. One second. It's very tosslated, though. Huh. I'm going to check on that after I do these real quick. NaOH? That's what I was thinking about, but NaOH is a base. Wait, nucleophile and base? Is it nucleophile and base? Oh yeah, it's nucleophile and base. Yeah, I th I'm pretty sure that's fine. Yeah, just go for NaOH. This you can't use because if you use this, you'd have to deprotonate once the water added. And that is SN1. But in a primary position, you are not allowed to do SN1. So really good for catching that. 
NaOH would be far better. It's just most of the time I see NaOH, it's a base. But it's also technically a weak nucleophile, so NaOH would be the better choice. This one, also primary, but a way you can get around this is, I remember someone mentioned HCN earlier, which I would have to get that checked to see if you can do that, because I've never seen you guys use that in your class. But I know that Kimomi said that if you tassel it, that that will not count as a step for your action for like determining SN1, SN2. So then your second step could just be NACN, and then you form this product because tosylating it turns it into OTS like this, and then you attack it with a strong nucleophile. For C, now this is tertiary, so this is much easier to work with because it's SN1. And this is also easy because you just know that we can just use HBR. And the lone pairs from here would pick up the H. This would form into water. And once it forms into water, it could leave. And then your BR minus could just attack, and then that problem's done. It's really simple. Hmm? Yeah, it's this one. For this one, also really simple. You just see it inverted its configuration. Also, this problem you guys probably won't have to do. I can show you how to do it, though. I don't think you guys are going to have to do that. It's order two. But I don't know. Uh, this one's really simple, just NASH, strong nucleophile, tax here, backside attack, inverted configuration, done, one step. This one, I'm not going to show you guys this, you guys, I don't see why you'd ever have that. Alright, so we have eight minutes left, so I'm going to go back to, yeah, some synthesis problems over here. All right, so I'll just work on, wait, are these the same? No. This, D. You want to do that one instead of E? Okay, so if you have this alkyne, If you have this alkyne, and you want to a add uh, OH on both sides, but you want them to be uh, anti-addition, you would need to add, if you just add H3O plus for one of them, and that'll give you, actually no, this is a way easier way to do this. Ignore what I just said for that one. Turn this into an alkene first. So I'm going to turn it into a transalkene. So like Na and NH3. First step. Second step. Really simple. You want anti-addition of alcohols. So all you need to do is anti-dihydroxylation. So it will be MCPBA, and then after you do MCPBA, you'll do H3O plus. And if you want to know what MCPBA does, oh, I did not draw the alkene. If you want to know what MCPBA does, uh, it basically just uses this double bond to form an epoxide. And then H3O plus will protonate this, and then you will have H2O, which will attack over here. Also, this is supposed to have like the same stereochemistry. And basically, you're just going to have this turn into an OH, 
this form into a water. They're going to have opposite stereochemistry when it does an attack over here. And then it'll deprotonate, and then you're just left with two opposite uh, stereochemistry on each uh, alcohol on adjacent carbons. Uh, five minutes left, so do you want to see how to do C, or would you rather see F? F. Okay. So you can do the same first step. Na in liquid ammonia. And then you just need to do syn dihydroxylation. So you can use KMNO4. NaOH cold. And that works the same as the other reagent. He gave you both reagents in class, but there's like an OSO4 reagent that you can use that does the same thing. Oh, I did not notice that. Yep, good by you. All right, so to add these carbons, you can do ETI, so NA, NH2 ETI would technically be first step. And then you would do for your third step. And then your fourth step, ETI. So you just do, wait, why was I saying ETI? Whoops. No, it's not going to be ETI. It's going to be MEI. Because you only want methyls on each side. So using this, we'll alkylate one methyl over here. And using this, we'll alkylate a methyl over here. So once you do that, you have both, methyl, but, uh, both methyls on each side. And then you just turn it into one of these alkenes again. And then using your KMNO4 NaOH cold will give you syn or is this for F? Those reagents that I just said give you syn. I thought this was uh, syn right here. This is supposed to be a dash, I believe. So this would give you the answer for E. These reagents give you E. It's kind of hard to see this printed out. To give you anti, which is this is anti, you would just use the MCPBA H3O plus again. Yes. It will just add to any side that has a hydrogen. Any NH2 pulls hydrogens. So you have a hydrogen on one side, so it's going to pull that. And then the negatively charged lone pair will pick up the methyl because it's positively charged. And then you have a hydrogen on the other side, so you can have the NaNH2 pick up the other hydrogen. So it doesn't matter which order they go, it's still, they're just going to do the same thing. OK, and then. Yes, MCPBA H3O plus gives you anti addition or anti dihydroxylation, while KMNO4 NaOH cold gives you syn dihydroxylation. For fifth step. For which one, E or F? Because for E, we want I didn't realize that these were supposed to be anti. So use KMNO4 NaOH cold to give you syn. These are both the same. But to give you anti, you need MCPBA, MCPBA H3O plus to give you anti for these ones. Yes, because that meth or added a methyl to one side of this alkaline or alkene or alkyne, and then this one added the other methyl. KMNO4 NaOH cold would be that would technically be six because we still need to turn it into this trans alkene. Those reagents get rid of one double bond. So we, the fifth step would be uh, I will just scribble this out. All right. The fifth step would be this Na in liquid ammonia. And then your sixth step would be MCPBA. And then your seventh step would be H3O plus. That is how to get this anti addition on this one. 
Yes. While for this alkyne, your last two steps would have been the syndihydroxylation, which would have been KMnO4 and NaOH gold. Does anyone have any last minute questions? Acidity of compounds. So you look at the atoms that they have. If they have the same atoms, you have to look at your next step. See if they can be resonance stabilized. If one has resonance structures and the other one doesn't, that would be a big giveaway. If the resonance structures, like if it, they have only two resonance structures versus three resonance structures, you're going to want to pick the one with the most resonance structures. Um, if you don't look at that, or like if they have the same amount and that's not a good enough thing to give it away, you look at induction. So if you have like, uh, let's say a chlorine or something next to a carbonyl or an oxygen next to a carbonyl, the induction of the electronegative atom uh, next to the like partially positive carbonyl will have induction, that effect, will also make it more acidic, something like that. Is that making sense? So then the last step, which is the least important because except for in that rare situation where you had an NH minus versus an alkyne, that's orbitals. The orbitals trump NH minus. Triple bonds are, like if you have an SP, yeah, for nitrogen, that's the exception. But if you just have like something that's single bonded carbons and you see that something is triple bonded carbons, you're going to want to choose the triple bonded carbons over your single bonded. So those are some things to look for. Yes. Uh, I don't think so. I can check real quick. Yeah, I think that's like the only exception is triple bond, which is why they pointed out as like an exception. Go to, you mean the video? Not or the video, no worksheet.